Hello again, and uh, welcome to another session. Tonight's topic is the stuff overhead. Yes, I'm referring to uh, satellites in orbit, but not just a particular brand of constellation satellites, but uh, all the stuff that's up there. And there's, uh, let's just say, a lot. <laughs> there's, there's a couple of uh, elephants in the room and gorillas in the room <laughs> that... <laughs> When people want to complain about all the satellites that are up there, they have a particular focus on where the light is shining currently in the media hype, and they forget about all the other stuff that's being put up there, even to this day, and the stuff that's still up there from the mid to late 1950s. That's oh, yeah. just junk, debris, bits uh, that, you know, they don't have a solution for that, but that's not something they can complain about on the uh, public soapbox. So. Uh, but before we get into, the, uh, into that, let's do some news. Uh, so much as the session that I had on spectroscopy, uh, if your instrument can't detect it, it doesn't mean it's not there. It just means your instrument can't detect it. Uh, if you remember back to the early days of the Curiosity space probe, uh, when it landed on Mars and it roamed around, it found these things it liked to call blueberries. And they're just little stones. They're the kinds of stones that uh, um, form as water evaporates from a lake bed. And uh, they were identified as hematite. And that's because the instrument that they had on board Curiosity could detect hematite. Well, there's another similar thing to hematite called hydrohematite. And hydrohematite has less iron in it and water, and the water is chemically absorbed into the geologic formation, so it's not like the water is running, it's just chemically a part of the stone. And they said, oh, you know, we can't tell hematite versus hydrohematite given what Curiosity was looking at. So if it was actually hydrohematite that, it, that found, that means the water existed a lot longer than if it was hematite. Because if it's hydrohematite, the water went away so slowly, it got absorbed into the rock rather than being cooked out of it. So if, if there really is hydrohematite on Mars, and there's a large quantity of it, as you, here's hematite and here's hydrohematite. The instruments on board Curiosity could detect hematite because of its iron content. But if the iron content was really low, because it had absorbed a lot of water, um, it might look similar. This is a highly magnified image of it. It might look similar, but if it's hydrohematite, there be water in those little blueberries. Uh, and yeah, that means the water would have been around on Mars a lot longer, but it also means that if you find lots of this, you can actually crush it and heat it and get water out of it. And that may be a uh, limited supply source of water on Mars once we uh, spend some time on Mars. The comet called 3200 Phaethon, or Phaethon um, is a uh, recurring comet, and it's actually the source of the Gemnids meteor shower. And they did some analysis on the stuff coming out of the comet when the sun heats it up and found there's not a lot of water there. How can you have these lovely vapor trails if it's not a lot of water? And they went back and looked at it and realized that it's not water at all. It's sizzling sodium. So apparently this comet has a lot of sodium in it. And when it gets heated up by the sun, it spews sodium vapor out, not water vapor. So this will be an unusual comet tail because that would mean that the meteors and meteorites would be higher in concentrations of sodium than other meteorites. So they're looking for um, specific meteorites associated with this comet to try and confirm their belief that uh, it's sizzling sodium and not uh, water vapor. Learn something new every day. Just when you think you had a complete understanding of comets and having water vapor coming off their tail, not, not always water, sometimes sodium. And I found this one fascinating, the uh, NASA uh, outsourced program for building the spacesuits for when we return to the moon. 
the spacesuits are not going to be ready by 2024. Ooh. Okay. And why haven't we heard about it until now? Because that's only, you know, three years away. Uh, uh, I guess the uh, contractor um, didn't want to get replaced like Blue Origin got replaced when their stuff didn't work on time. And so what happened was uh, Elon said, you know, SpaceX could build you those spacesuits by 2024 because SpaceX already has spacesuits on board the astronauts on their crewed missions. So, you know, a few things would be certainly different, but it's still spacesuit technology. You still have to do the thermal protection, the radiation protection, you know, the, the uh -huh. pressure protection. You have to have the oxygen supply. So all the stuff that they do already, you just, you know, up in steroids a little bit and uh, you can do that. Now, if, if you look these closely, you see the giant pack on the back. These are not the kind that uh, mount into the rover on the moon. These are the kinds that uh, you get dirt on the outside and track your dirt inside the rover. So this is not the equivalent of the Mars rover spacesuits. Huh. But we're running behind on things. Of course, the first thing everyone wants to blame is COVID. And, and if that doesn't work out, then uh, chip shortage. You know, we, we can't get the chips. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. How many chips are in this uh, backpack? Oh, I'm sure there's a lot of them in there, but how many of them are unique and not in the, uh, that are in the not available now syndrome? Probably not that many, and they could redesign it somewhat. Oh, that's right. They outsource it so it's a fixed design. Oh, no wonder I can't get a PlayStation 5. <laughs> yeah, because the, you know when you outsource the designs of these things, and you think Sony actually designed the PlayStation? No, no, they put the specs together and had some third party build it for them. Whenever you yeah. outsource circuit boards and components, if the components suddenly become short in inventory, um, you just can't build the circuit boards because you have no parts to put in them. Well, what about turning too quickly and redesigning it with different chips? Uh, that would cost a lot of money because you've got to spend that money with your outsource contractor to redesign it. You know, when you're dealing yeah. with a, an auto manufacturer like Tesla, they don't outsource a lot. So their circuit board designs and the chip selection are all done in house. So when it, you know, when uh, other companies like GM and Ford say, ah, we, we've got to temporarily suspend production because we can't get the chips, Tesla saw that and said, Let's not let that, that hold us back. So they turned to and redesigned the circuit board to use the chips that were available. And they did have a brief suspension and they're back you know, producing them again because they can do that because it's all in-house. I, yeah, I think they're going to replace the PlayStation 5 chips with something a little bit more powerful because they can't get the ones they want. Well, it, it's always a, a balance on gaming consoles of you don't want to put more horsepower in there such that it jacks the price up, but you don't want to put too little horsepower in there because then people won't buy the dedicated game console and they'll just run it on their Windows machine. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> okay, Perseverance, NASA's rover on Mars. Oh, that's a hole. Um, is about to do its second soil scoop, hoping this time they found a hole, uh, you know, they found a rock they can drill into that won't become powder as they drill it. I think yeah. they're in for a shock. Uh, I, think that, <laughs> I think a lot of the things that are called rocks on Mars, once you start abrading them, they become powder rather quickly because there's so little water in them. And, you know, the water left may be slower than they thought, which allowed it to become powder instead of becoming hard rock. So we'll, we'll see the second time. But they are getting smarter. This time when they pull the uh, core head out, they're literally going to turn the core head where the camera can see inside the core head before they waste another sample container ah. on nothing. So then they're getting a little smarter. They're learning. Yeah, that is smart. But, but they're going to try it a second time, which is good. Ingenuity flew a 12th time. Uh, I don't know if they're, they're doing this just to see if Ingenuity will fail. 
uh, they, I, they call her Little Jenny Ingenuity. Uh, yeah, that's the Ingenuity <laughs> song name. Um, they're flying the helicopter over rougher and rougher terrain. This is now terrain that the rover cannot go over because the terrain is too sharp and rough. And they're using the helicopter to take pictures of terrain that the rover will never get to to see if there's anything different. Because if the rover sticks to only the uh, more flat spots, uh, there's lots of areas where the rover will not be investigating. So they're going to use the helicopter to look where the rover can't go. Good idea. Uh, they, they, they were concerned that the, ca the, the uh, helicopter's auto navigation, uh, which is done autonomously without human assistance, um, if it spots something jagged and it happens to have a flat top on it, will it think that's an okay place to land in an emergency? Or will it you know, try and get to where it really needs to be if it runs into problems? So they're uh, changing their risk assessments with the Ingenuity helicopter, and they're leaning more towards um, <coughs> riskier than risk avoidance because they've already done all the original science and engineering proof of concept that they wanted to do with ingenuity. And now it's just, give it some challenges. What can it do? Uh -huh. We may soon have a, uh, hopefully not on its 13th flight, lucky that, but uh, we may soon see someday that it just went somewhere it, it, it couldn't recover from. And now you have a wow. permanent permanent helicopter just sitting on Mars waiting for an astronaut to walk by, pick it up, dust it off, and fly it again. Yeah. That'd be good. So people might have forgotten, but China also has a rover on Mars, and it's yeah. in uh, Utopia Planitia, a nice big flat spot with, without much to look at, but uh, um, you know they're starting off uh, conservatively, just like we did. Um, so it's done all of the science it was planned to do in its first 90 days. And now they're just like, uh, well, it's still operational. It's still working. Let's have it do new and different things. So they're looking for other things that it can go off and do. They haven't figured out quite yet, but uh, uh, they're going to continue to operate it. Um, the, you know, the, the Chinese government is saying, yeah, yeah, we, we, we want to continue to be in the limelight here, so let's continue funding this, because now that they've got all the hard stuff done, the cost of running the operations center is, you know, maybe uh, 20 people uh, on three shifts. So for less the number than the number of people you have operating your average McDonald's, they can continue to uh, do their uh, rover on Mars. Um, they don't have 24-7 coverage of the rover, because they don't have the deep space network and the space network like NASA does. So there are windows during the day when they can talk to their rover. And there's probably, uh, oh, 16 hours or so during the day when it's on its own or it's just sitting parked. Are they going to sell their information to other countries or? Um, they're claiming that the information will be made available publicly. They're not going to sell it. They're just going to, you know, here's the website. Go look at it. So I, I think that would be interesting because we can compare notes between Curiosity and Zerong. Yeah, that would be a good idea. Uh, um, so there's a place called the National Ignition Facility. Uh, if you remember when they rebooted the Star Trek movie series, they showed you what was supposed to be the innards of the warp drive uh, engineering bay and all this big, heavy, large equipment. Uh, and that was actually the that was actually the National Ignition Facility at Lawrence Livermore Labs. Huh? Yep. And uh, they're getting closer and closer to uh, uh, having a sustained um, fusion ignition. They got up to 1.3 megajoules. And if you ask yourself, well, how much of that, how, how much is that in real words? <laughs> they generated for 100 trillionths of a second. That's oh. more than billions, folks. 
100 trillionths of a second, they generated 10 quadrillion watts of power, which sounds like an enormous amount of energy until you, you know, let's convert that to kilowatt hours. And it's not ready to replace any power plants in Florida. <laughs> and given that, we, that it only ran for 100 trillionths of a second, it's not sustained yet. So, um, you know, good next step, but nowhere yeah. near prime time. <laughs> so, toddle on, you know, someday they'll figure it out. I just wonder that if it takes them another 10 or 20 years to get a sustained uh, fusion ignition and they can find enough uh, heavy water to run it and enough uh, uh, helium-3 to act as a neutron shield for it, that it'll be so cost ex excessive compared to solar and wind that I'm sorry, it's too little, too expensive and too late. But uh, it's good technology to have if you want to go um, you know, on a long duration rocket flight and you need a lot of power for a really long time. Um, you can take in the hydrogen via your bus art collectors. Love that one. Mm -hmm. uh, that's, that's those long shiny tubes on the uh, Star Trek Enterprise. The front of those are bus art collectors and they collect uh, ionized hydrogen from background space. And then they accelerate that uh, in their fusion reactor and that's how their uh, engines work, uh, their um, impulse engines, not their warp drive. Their warp drive works off of an antimatter uh, ignition. Anyway, enough about the National Ignition Facility. How about this one? There be a new island off of Japan. Oh. An undersea volcano just started spewing itself underwater and that cooled it off fast enough that it formed an island. Now, the island is only about, uh, let's see, uh, 82 feet high right now, but it's still mm. going on. So it, it could be a much larger island than this. Uh, if you remember back, um, all of a sudden, there was a volcano outside of Mexico City, and it was a lovely, low-performing cinder cone, and it just kept, it wasn't producing a lot of, lava it was just this same sort of ashy cinder cone and now it's a you know i think a 300 foot tall mountain uh outside of mexico city so if um i don't know what the ocean depth is this far off of japan uh but uh if it continues for a while um you know you, you could actually see uh a lot of land mass out there and who will claim it is this a Japanese island? Is this a Korean island? Is this a Chinese island? Who owns this? China. That's one of the questions I have on a podcast series called Aftershock, which is about a, um, an earthquake at, that suddenly forms an island off the coast there. And they're trying to figure out whether I'm at the point where they're trying to figure out who owns that. Well, China actually built an island in the uh, uh, South Pacific quite uh, close. I won't say quite close. I'll just say offshore from Vietnam. And uh, they literally built an island. They just hauled out a bunch of debris and dirt and stuff. And the water was shallow enough there. They built a large island. And now it's a Chinese military observation base. Hmm. Oh. <laughs> That's all they need. <laughs> yeah, and uh, you know, there's a lot of uh, hoopla, as the saying goes, about it. But mm -hmm. uh, if you can build your own island and it's outside the 12 mile limit of any other nation, whose island is it? Should it be the uh, owned by the whoever it was that built it, or by the nation that's closest to it but still, you know, more than a hundred miles offshore? Mm -hmm. It's kind of like, what if an aircraft carrier could set down routes and stay somewhere? Kind of the same thing. Yeah, but with global warming, it might raise up to the point where they don't have their island anymore. That's a good point. You have to keep it, you know, if, if you only make it 82 feet above uh, sea level, um, you may be 20 feet above sea level in another decade or so. So 
you have to constantly building, keep building it up. But I would say Japanese are good at that. There's this airport called Kensai that uh, the airport was built as an extension to a garbage island, uh, you know, a garbage mound kind of island. And they just built a major metropolitan airport there. And after a while, they realized, holy cow, the whole airport's sinking. <laughs> so they, well, every few years, they jack up all the buildings at the airport and they pave the runways thicker to always stay ahead of the sinking island. Yeah. But isn't that the, the principle of making islands goes way back um, and they called them atolls? No, an, an atoll is a, uh, you, if you take a volcanic cone that's been uh, cut off at sea level and then a coral reef grows on top of it and the yeah. coral reef gets ground up over time and you have beach sand that accumulates, you have this uh, C shape, you know, letter C shaped thing, and those are called coral atolls. And uh, during our early days of, uh, hey, let's test some nuclear weapons. We picked some <laughs> uninhabited atolls in the South Pacific that, well, we didn't own them, but nobody else claimed them. So we just you know, detonated some warheads there to see how big and bad we could make our bombs and we stationed scrap ships offshore to see what our, our Navy would be subjected to if 20 miles away, somebody detonated a warhead. Uh, so that's you know, where I learned about coral atolls. And these atolls are, yeah, they're, they're not sinking, the water's getting higher. So pretty soon there'll be no atoll at all. Not at all, uh, not at all. Uh, yeah, so. Well, I, I was thinking more in terms of Easter Island, you know, where they, uh, you know, in the movie Rapa Nui, they went out and put dirt yes. on, uh, and, and it was a rite of passage or something mm -hmm. to, to get out there and come back. Yeah, um, those, those are uh, rite of passage challenges, and it's just good that, you know, that one's not all that difficult. There are other ones that uh, you lose a few uh, students along the way every year. Those, those are not the <laughs> yeah. right message. But I, I think that um, that island is uh, safe. It's high enough. It's got mountains on it. Um, but there are a lot of islands in the Pacific that are going to be, uh, if they're not going to lose their fresh water and be driven away, they will be inundated by water and have to leave because. Yeah, yeah. Of course, you could build all your houses on stilts. You, you could take a book out of uh, um, Italy and uh, you know learn how to put little stilt walkways around everything during the high water seasons of the year. That's, that's Venice. <laughs> but the thing to learn from this is the earth is still changing. Be prepared for it and uh, accommodate whatever you need to face the planet. So uh, they already have a name for the island. Oh, what is it? Nishinoshima. Here it is. Nishinoshima. Yeah, yeah. Good name. Which is a nice Japanese name. So I'm going to uh -huh. say that Japan is claiming it. We put a name on it. It's ours. <laughs> it's, it's like the book, uh, The Shock of the Anthropocene, uh, where they you know predict some of the effects of climate change. Yep. I don't know if you've ever read that one. No, but uh, I've, I've seen information and articles on it. I haven't, I haven't read the actual uh, treatise on it. Yeah. Uh, but I also am aware that there were five cataclysmic events on Earth that reset us almost back to, um, you know, discover what DNA is all about again. Uh, <laughs> yep. You know, how much more farther would our technology be advanced if we hadn't reset things five times? Uh, and we're about to pull a reset again with, you know, what we're doing with the environment, maybe a hundred to a couple of hundred years from now, we may be undergoing a reset. And uh, you think that involve a magnetic shift of poles? I think there will be some things affected by that, but I think life will go on. Uh -huh. um, you know, we no longer use magnetic compasses to discern our navigation. 
We now use GPS satellites and they certainly won't be affected by it. Um, That's true. Things that have magnetometers in them though, will be affected by it. So maybe your, yeah. uh, your quad rotor that you're flying with its little uh, magnetometer inside so it knows how to orient itself, will have to use differential GPS instead. But that's doable. Yeah, you can do that. If, if you have two different GPS receivers that are slightly separated and you receive the satellite triangulation information, uh, you can use the um, signal to noise ratio difference between the two to know which way the satellite is by compass direction. And if you can do that, you can orient yourself without a magnetic compass. Ooh. So there's already technology out there. Now we just have to touch things up a bit. <clears throat> Tesla is going to be building humanoid looking robots. Now, if you watch their uh, demonstration video, it was actually a guy in a suit. <laughs> but this, this uh, diagram that they show you, that's not a guy in a suit. That's the actual uh, exterior structure that they plan on building. And of course, it says Tesla across the chest. Uh, but we'll, we'll see what they do with it. <clears throat> I, think if I think if Tesla really wanted to be involved in humanoid-like robotics, they would have just bought um, Boston Dynamics when they were looking for new money and they got acquired by um, Hyundai. Mm -hmm. um, wow. You'd swear it's a guy in a suit. It's not. You'd swear it's a guy in one of those motion capture suits. It's not. If you look wow. where the head is, there's cameras, and this robot is dynamically determining its progress as it moves. Wow. It's going to get, look at that, how he leaps over the bar. And watch this. He missteps and he has to correct his position. Here we go. Synchronized. Ready? Ta da Backflips. <laughs> Second backflips. Just to prove we can do it. I like how one of the robots like shoves off his shoulder and the other goes, yay. That's what Boston like Dynamics robot does. Robot Olympics. <laughs> I think a robot <laughs> Olympics would be cool. Yeah. Apparently, all over the place. apparently the fancier restaurants that always want to do something new and different and save money um, are replacing menus with a little stand on the table that has the QR code for the restaurant's menu and it goes out to an internet website, hopefully not a proprietary app for the restaurant. It goes out to an internet website where you can read the menu online. And there will be no menu on your table. And the idea is that way you don't have a, an unsanitary menu that the last thousand people touched and you're trying to order your food off of it. Of course, what they're really saying is, if we do our menus via QR codes, that's thousands of dollars per year that the restaurant will not have to spend to have menus printed. Think about it for a moment. You go to one of those upscale restaurants, they don't print you know, glossy menus anymore. You have a, a holder. It's this very thick padded thing. And when you open it up, it's just got two printed sheets of paper in it. And that's tonight's menu. It's very posh. But what it I means, what it means is, yeah, what, what it means is they're not going out to a printing company and having menus printed and laminated. They're just going in the back room. They got some fancy paper. They print out the menu using some, you know, Microsoft Word or something. And there's your menu. But they're not even going to spend that. They're just going to have all the customers in the restaurant get out your cell phones. Oh, it's got to be a smart enough cell phone to have a QR code reader. Everyone has though one of those nowadays, don't they? Oh, and how are they going to go to the internet to get that if uh, there's not good, you know, 4G or 3G or 5G inside your restaurant? Because your restaurant happens to be, let's say, I don't know, 
a basement restaurant. Oh, well, then you're going to have to provide Wi-Fi. How much is that going to cost you? So I don't think they've quite figured all this out. I think the downside here is a lot of printing companies in uh, cities with lots of restaurants will soon be losing out on their quarterly menu printing and laminating business, which is, okay, technology has displaced some people's jobs and maybe closed some small print shops. But uh, this is how- I'm thinking, I'm thinking they can jack up the prices like immediately on, well, on I they, they can do that. They, they can change the price from the moment you walk in the restaurant. So if, if you read the menu before you get to the restaurant, and then you get to the restaurant and you go to check out and the check has, you know, 15% higher prices on it. It's like, sorry, did you read the fine print where it says we can change the prices without notifying you? Yeah. Yeah. So uh, I've seen those things outside of restaurants, laminated on tables. Yeah. Yeah. Because you only have to do it once. And then you just change the website and you never have to commit to physical paper or lamination or, or any of that stuff. And in fact, uh, there are restaurants that use uh, um, big screen TVs turned 90 degrees out in front of the restaurant to display their menu rather than printing the menu and putting it inside of a glass case. Mm -hmm. You know, nobody, you know, everybody will focus on how many jobs are being lost in the automotive industry as, you know, we further automate building cars but i'm sure that if you evaluate the migration to qr codes across the entire united states and maybe around the world that's a lot more thousands of jobs that are going to go away just by you know hurting the printing industry by 15 to 20 percent of their business uh -huh. so but nobody you know i'm one of those people that connect dots so i look at yes. big systems Good. No, this, this is going to be some small print shops going away and some print shop workers not having enough business to keep the level of staff that they have and having to let a couple of people go. Yep. Anyway. So uh, it's not that I'm picking on Chevy or G, you know, GM or uh, the Bolt particular car. It's just they're undergoing a lot of learning lessons that um, people ignore that, you know, Tesla had these delay problems and redesign problems. And, you know, now that Tesla is up running and rather smoothly and making a profit, uh, we forget that all these other internal combustion engine companies that have been producing millions of cars for decades are now having to go through their own set of learnings. And, uh, if you recall that uh, GM had a problem with the Chevy Bolt, that their battery thermal management system was causing the back seat to catch fire and burning up the vehicles. And they said, oh, it's only the 2017 to 2019 model. Uh, okay. This week, GM said, uh, I guess it's all the Chevy Bolt and Bolt you know, EVs, you know, not just the regular model Bolt, but the crossover model Bolt, both of those, all of them are being recalled and the battery packs are being replaced if your battery pack has less than 100,000 miles on it. And these are cars that are maybe four years old at most. So unless you drove it a lot, you're not gonna put 100,000 miles on it. The total cost for GM to do this is in excess of $1 billion. So, this is the price you pay for, oh, we're just going to outsource our battery packs and the battery thermal management. It'll all be good. Uh, apparently not. <laughs> now, if you remember, uh, Nissan brought their first electric vehicle out and it had no battery management whatsoever. And it basically uh, overused the batteries. You could overcharge them uh, so they would charge too rapidly and you could over discharge them, they would discharge too quickly. People go, it's an EV, I can drive really fast and accelerate and, and they suck too much power out of the batteries too quickly. And they, uh, you know, they didn't catch fire, but the chemistry got exhausted and they developed uh, 
uh, battery memory in what shouldn't be a problem, lithium batteries. Right. So the early Nissans had poor battery management because they had none. The latest model Nissan Leaf does have some limited battery management, but the uh, electric vehicle company that has the best battery management at the moment is Tesla. Strange that uh, they, they've, you know, they've learned all their lessons and they built a, uh, a hybrid battery management system that is not only the thermal management for the battery, it's also your uh, car cabin climate control. So if you need heating and air conditioning, it's run off the same module. If you need to um, uh, take heat away from the motors as they get up to high speed, same sort of thing. So they, they took one thing and made it, you know, five different functions in one module that's uh, about the size of a artisan loaf of bread, a smaller loaf of bread. Um, my, my understanding of some of these batteries is that with the memory, what you want to do is you want to run them completely out and then totally recharge them so they remember you that's, know, that they're... That's, that's the way that it works on mobile phones, but apparently yep. the, the, um, the electrolyte and the, the thin film that they use in car batteries is such that you don't want to charge it too quickly and you don't want to discharge it too quickly and you don't want to put it at 100% charge too often and you don't want to drain it to zero ever. So uh -huh. I, I think of a reason as to why you don't want to drain it to zero ever is then you can't make it to a charging station. So even when you have like a Model S and it says, You've got zero. It will let you drive slowly for another maybe 20 miles to get to a charging station. So the, the same way that in your gasoline powered vehicle, when, you know, when the indicator says it's empty, you've got maybe another eight miles you can drive to the gas station to get a fill up. I think that's going to have to revamp AAA to where they're going to have to like boost your charge instead of bring you gas. <laughs> I think that would be a good thing for them to do. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, because the, the way that they, they would need a universal charging adapter uh -huh. uh, to do that. And the, uh, the uh, truck that they use to bring you the charge has to have a motor generator in it to always keep that battery charged up. Uh, but in 15 minutes, you can get enough charge to take you to, you know, unless you're traveling cross country out in the middle of nowhere. Um, if you have to go 15 to 20 miles, you know, in under half an hour, you can be charged up to the point where you can do that. Yeah. It'd be interesting. Yeah. It, I mean, it is something you're thinking about. Um, Tesla was originally putting in their charging stations with the appropriate amount of distance between them based upon the kind of traffic that goes through an area. So you can look at traffic statistics and say, there's a lot of people that travel from here to here. So at each endpoint, we'll put a charging station. So that if you're somewhere in the middle, either one side or the other, you'll always have a close enough charging station. And that worked well. And then they found out, oh, now that we're selling more cars, we need more stations at a charging station. And then right. it was, now that we're selling higher performance cars, we need more power out of the charging stations. So they went to the supercharging stations and now they're you know, gonna be having the uh, semi trucks. So the even bigger charging <laughs> stations. <laughs> you just, you know, it's kind of like uh, back in the early days of gasoline, is <laughs> one kind of gasoline sufficient? No, you need three grades. Well, you still only need one grade, but you need more and more of it. So there'll, there'll, be, there'll be things similar. You know, people forget about the progression of gasoline stations from first there was none. And then Shell Oil of, of New Jersey uh, worked a deal with Ford Motor Company. Tell you what, you put in the stations, I'll build the cars. Uh, well, Tesla saw that and said, nobody's going to build the stations for us. We'll build the cars and the station. And now they're saying, well, there seems to be a lot of EVs out there and not much infrastructure to charge them. How about for the right amount of money, 
you can charge your Chevy Bolt at a Tesla charging station. Mm. And, you know, there are contracts when you buy certain models of uh, Tesla that forever or for the first in years, charging at a Tesla charging station is free. I mean, ah. you paid it into the vehicle, but, you know, charging is free, but you can't get your charging for free if you've got all of these uh, Audis and Volvos and GM products occupying all the charging station slots. Yes. So now Tesla is putting in the massive charging stations where they, you know, they might have 60 slips to charge cars in high traffic areas. And right now you see one or two cars in them. But they, they know that, but, you know, they know the vehicles are going to be coming. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> and I posted our uh, spectroscopy presentation from last week. Uh, it took me a while to edit it down. There was lots of stuff to, to clip out of there. Um, we went off on a tangent a couple of times. And I know that the general audience that are watching these from the outside in, uh, Maybe they'll appreciate the tangent, maybe not. I, I like to like uh, like to uh, identify it with, if you ever watch uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson's Star Talk series on National Geographic. Yep, I like that. Um, they start out with a particular topic and they have a comedian and the comedian takes things off on a tangent and you can kind of see the director occasionally having to bring it back to the main theme. Uh, uh -huh. so we have we have no director to bring us back to the main theme, so I just let us roam freely into whatever topics we want, and if it really gets too far off topic, then I can always clip that. We we remember what we're talking about, and if it gets too far off the rails, and somebody says it's pumpkin time, okay, I'll stop recording. But it you know, it, it doesn't take me um, a horrendous amount of time to just. Because if it's a two hour long session, it probably mm. takes me three hours to edit it because I have to listen to it front to back all the way through to go, oh, stop there, mark that, wait until it gets to the end of that part I want to cut out, mark that, delete that section, and then go on. Mm -hmm. But if I do that, you know, 20 times during a two hour session, that might add another hour to my editing. But you, know, you, you, you look at some of these YouTube uh, professionals and literally for a one hour session, they can spend more than four hours at the edit bay because they like to have it perfect and they have no audience. They have no live audience. So if they flub something, they just clip out the flub, re-record it, patch it in, and it looks so professional. And then they show you the bloopers and outtakes at the end of it and you go, wow, no wonder it takes you four hours to edit one hour. Yeah, all the movies take a long time to edit too. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I did some of the uh, audio editing back in the day on reel to reel tape. <laughs> Exacto <Yeah>. Blade, <laughs> special kind of scotch tape. Yeah, yeah. sure. Yeah, I remember that. I remember that. Editing block, little editing block. Yeah, and uh, I did it a little bit with Super 8 movie film for my uncle, uh, but that just got to be too tedious because the film would would get hard and you would crack the film and you know, I just cut that section out. Okay. Uh, and then when um, 3D animation and video, uh, digital video started to come into play, uh, I still have it sitting over on the shelf over there, a new tech video toaster and a Commodore Amiga computer. So I, I did a lot of that stuff, uh, original editing in video. And that took a while because it was uh, first of its kind interface, and it was a bit ungainly, but the uh, the NCH uh, video pad software that I use actually comes out of Australia, and it's, it's under 100 bucks. It's cheap, um, and you know it's not one of these cloud-based things where you have to pay an annual fee for it. I buy a copy now, and you know, four or five years from now, if it has some new features, you can invest another under 100 bucks and get yourself an updated copy. So I, I like that company, NCH. They produce I used their uh, WavePad audio software um, for editing just audio. And the, the two editing suites work together. So if I have a video that I want to go in and do some massaging on the audio, I can take the audio out, go over to WavePad, 
edit the audio and then just paste it back in in the same slot. So it works well. We, we grew up with uh, wire recorders. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah, my, my father had one of those in his business office for dictation. Yeah. A wire recorder. And that dictaphone, would be- Remember the dictaphone machine? His Big was a genuine dictaphone, yes. Um, and you had the pedal. The, the uh, secretary, while she was transcribing, she had a pedal on the floor that she could, you know, stop and resume the uh, audio recording so she could type. Yeah, we had the big reel-to-reel -reel wire recorder. Yeah, years ago when we were throwing out stuff that we no longer used at Fox Observatory, uh, we had a reel-to-reel -reel tape recorder there. And it was using the reel-to-reel -reel tape recording for recording data from solar prominence observations on radio as recording the audio of the radio. <laughs> they never did anything with it except go, look what we did. Yeah. Because back then there was there were no digital tools to analyze the data and go, oh, oh, I see a Doppler shift there. So is there <laughs> any other news that I might have missed? No, it's pretty good. Okay. Okay, good evening. Uh, this evening's discussion is the stuff overhead. And if you're wondering what the stuff is, I'm talking about Earth orbiting stuff like satellites, spent rocket boosters, and just debris. Um, there are operational satellites up there. There are a lot of non-operational, dead, run out of fuel, you know, went off on a tangent, couldn't control. Um, there's lots of junk up there. All the rockets that had to get to higher orbit or had to leave the Earth and go somewhere else like the moon or some other planet, they usually have a third stage hanging around in Earth orbit for years to come. And then there's just debris. When you see um, stuff coming off of a rocket, clamps and screws and stuff, um, that's stuff floating around in orbit that's moving at thousands of miles per hour. So it has to be tracked. And then when you see two painted uh, rocket stages and they separate, when they separate, the separation is usually by explosive bolts and that will blow paint chips off of the outside of the, the two rocket stages. And those paint chips, if they're large enough, they have enough mass that moving at you know, 19,000 miles an hour, they can give a spacesuit a bad day. So they even have to track paint chips. So the size and reflectivity of what we put up there, in other words, how much of a nuisance it is to us looking up, uh, varies by the size of the satellite. You might have heard of things called nanosats or nanoscale satellites. These can be as small as, you know, uh, a sticky notes cube. That's called a one one u by one u or a one by one cube. Uh, that's you see a lot of uh, colleges, uh, high schools even producing uh, one new uh, cube sets. And uh, those get lofted up as just another payload on board with other things all going on a single launch. For example, this uh, one in the lower left here, this is a one by five. Uh, the one is four inch by four inch, I think it is. And then the five is one, two, three, four, five deep. So they can be long and rectangular. They can be cube shaped. Uh, they can be squared. It all depends upon how much electronics you want to put in there. But suffice it to say, if you're launching one satellite and you need an Ariane 5 or a Falcon Heavy or an Atlas 5 Model 500, this is a multi-ton satellite like the one here on the right. These things are as big as school buses or you know, as big as the proverbial Greyhound bus. That's how big these satellites are. And you launch one of them inside the fairing of these kinds of rockets. So whenever you hear about, ah, oh, there's gonna be a launch of a, uh, an Ariane 5 from uh, South America, what are they launching? One communication satellite. It's gonna be a whopping big communication satellite with this, this is the folded up solar panels for it. The solar panels, may be um, the size of a couple of tennis courts end to end. So if you want to talk about things that are large and reflective, 
And if they did go off on a tangent and get in the way of some other satellite, it's destruction of several satellites. This is the stuff that's going to cause it, not the little satellites. You know, because if a uh, a one U CubeSat hits something large like the space station, it might do some damage, and they'd have to, uh, you know, any loss of pressure, they'd have to uh, seal off that section. But it's not going to destroy the space station. If this sucker goes off on a tangent doing 19,000 against the 19,000 of the ISS, this is day over for the ISS. So it also, the, the reflectivity also varies by the size of the solar panels. Here's a 1U CubeSat, and this is the solar panel on top of it. So this produces enough electricity to power the electronics inside this CubeSat. Look, there's an old style uh, DB9 RS-232 serial cable. There's a connector right there. Yeah. Modern satellite, reliable technology. So you can also have satellites where the satellite itself is about the size of a ping pong table, uh, but the solar panel is much larger than that. This is actually a uh, uh, SpaceX Starlink satellite. And we'll get into those a little later. Or you can have two solar arrays the size of billboards. This is one side of the solar array. There's another one that will be mounted on the other side of a large geostationary communication satellite. So if you're talking about things that might be reflective and visible from Earth astronomical observatories, this is going to be your, your issue. Not this, because this will be pointed out sideways. And when it's reflecting, it's reflecting. This is actually going to be pointed vertical. So there's no way a reflection can actually appear directly below it. We'll get into how that works. And then your antenna size. OK, this is a GPS current uh, generation of the version 3F uh, GPS satellite. It has a bunch of these sticks. These are all um, communication satellites, uh, sorry, communications antennas for all the other uh, relays it has to do. And th this is the primary communications connection for ground control. So this is just one satellite with an array. Now, this one's about the size of a, uh, um, a small dumpster. You think of the small dumpsters out behind restaurants, not the long ones that they use on construction sites for the smaller dumpsters. This satellite's about the size of a dumpster. The solar panel, there's only one of them, and the solar panel is about as big as two ping pong tables. Uh, here is a uh, SpaceX Starlink. This is the original version of the satellite. Notice it has flat panels for the antennas and very few of them. The whole satellite bottom is the size of a ping pong table. The panels were originally white, and white's reflective. They're not glassy white. They're just white, and white's reflective. So when you hear about the, uh, the dark sat, when they made changes, when, when uh, SpaceX made changes, and they put up the dark sat, all they did was take the plastic that covers the, the flat paint, uh, planar antennas and made them flat black plastic instead of flat white plastic. And that cut the uh, reflectivity down. And if you look at the surface of the satellite, it has this very fine pebbly gray finish, which is dispersal. It, it, it's not highly reflective. If you look at this flat panel, if this flat panel were turned downward, that would be very reflective. Then you have the much larger antennas. This is a uh, communications satellite. This is a 60 foot diameter parabolic dish antenna. And if you know anything about a parabolic dish, if you shine light into it, it's going to focus the light. So the light, if, if this antenna is meant to communicate with the ground, then any light shining in here, the focal point will be to a small spot on the ground. So which do you think is going to produce more reflectivity? This ping pong paddle size, the ping pong table size thing that has black flat panels on it, or this? 60 foot parabolic dish. Yeah. Now, if you want even bigger, um, 
the uh, U.S. National Reconnaissance Office in conjunction with the CIA and the Air Force launch, how do we make a satellite parabolic antenna even bigger? Because what we want to do is pick up all the cell phones somewhere in the Middle East. You know, so if we can, from space, tap into all cell phone calls that are occurring in a large area, like a uh, large city in the U.S. National Reconnaissance Office, the NRO, in conjunction with the U.S. CIA uh, and the Air Force, wanted to produce how big a parabolic dish antenna they could make in order to receive, let's say, all the cell phone calls in uh, a major metropolitan city of Iran or Iraq or somewhere in the Middle East. And they produced this thing. This would obviously not fit inside of even the largest rocket ferry. This is a hundred feet across. Mm -hmm. And the struts themselves are actually inflated tubes of mylar. So they didn't have much satellite here. They just put this little dummy at the bottom to make sure that they could send and receive signals. Uh, so they could control the satellite and the satellite could pick up mobile phones and then they could relay them back down to earth. These are short duration satellites they put in low earth orbit and they burn up. But if you're talking about something being reflective, a large, you know, 100 foot diameter piece of mylar uh, would be very reflective. And then surface area. What about the surface area of the spacecraft itself? People like looking at the International Space Station, but it's the largest thing up there. And because they've added newer, larger solar panels, it's getting more and more reflective. So if you want to talk about we're, we're trying to make things that are not bright up there, um, the ISS is a big contributor, but it's only one. And it has a lot of uh, you know, moral significance to proud accomplishment of the planet. Um, yeah, the ISS is one of the elephants in the room of Look at all those satellites. Aren't they terrible? Well, what about this one? Oh, we like looking at the ISS. And then there's the ones that, oh, you're not going to do anything about those because it's not cost effective. Spent rocket boosters. This is a third stage of a Saturn V. And it's still in orbit. After all these decades, it's still up there. And it's white. And it's round. And it's highly reflective. And you can actually see these on the satellite prediction programs. As, Wouldn't you like to go see some rocket booster from the late 60s? No. Modern uh, technology that we put up for communications is things like the Starlink satellite. Matte black finishes, pebble matte finish surfaces, very low reflectivity much smaller surface area, and the solar panels are above it, not out to the side. When you look at the media hype that's out there, it's, it's basically where the light is shining and the biggest name that they can poke a sharp stick at. Yes, SpaceX Starlink is the most success, successful launcher of satellites by count, and therefore they're the most hyped in the media. There are thousands of things already up there. They're larger and brighter than Starlink satellites. There's a lot of junk up there that's been up there since the late 50s. That's no longer operational, but it's not coming down anytime soon because it's not worth it to send a dedicated space tug up to pull it back down. A higher orbit is slower to go overhead than a low Earth orbit. So when you think about, uh, when you, if you've ever watched the ISS go overhead, it goes overhead in a couple of minutes. Well, uh, Starlink satellites are actually below the ISS. So they'll go overhead faster. If you think about the uh, Greyhound bus sized things they put up in geostationary orbit, those are much higher orbits. When you get to geostationary, it's parked. It's not going anywhere. It's going to be there. So every time the sun rises and sets, you're going to get a reflection off of these things. Debris. 
There's all kinds of debris up there, clamps, paint chips, metal flakes, all different sizes. It's just not cost effective to go up there and try and get back something so small. And as I mentioned, these spent rocket boosters, these are large. And uh, you know, every time we launch a satellite up to geostationary orbit, there's going to be a upper stage that's going to be up in orbit for 10 plus years. It's just not cost effective to go up there and drag it back down. And some of the satellites we put up there in are the, are the uh, satellites that have the Molnia orbits. They're very long elliptical orbits. And when they go non-operational, they're going to be up there for hundreds of years because every time they come back close to the Earth, they get another velocity boost uh, from a gravitational acceleration. The folks that launch the biggest, most reflective stuff tend to be the US government, major corporations, and other nations. Um, the, the corporations that are launching satellite constellation programs their satellites in general are far smaller than the uh, big satellites they launch into geostationary orbit. But the numbers are increasing. Um, so everybody knows that, that Starlink has over a thousand satellites up there. OneWeb has 254 already up there. They were gonna launch another 34 this week, but uh, Roscosmos had a, a problem with their uh, launch vehicle and so they had to take it back into the shop, as the saying goes. Blue Origin, Project Kuiper, Amazon, uh, they have yet to put up any full-time satellites. Uh, they have booked passage on nine Atlas V launch vehicles because they couldn't get their New Glenn rocket going soon enough. Uh, so they also want to do it, but they, they can't. Um, Telsat Lightspeed. Uh, India has a plan for 298 satellites. Uh, also using the same Telsat light speed is uh, a company called Gilat Aquarius in Israel and uh, another company called TIM in Brazil. They're all using the same platform, same launch vehicle, but they're going to have their own instruments on board the satellite. And then the Hongyang uh, Constellation Satellite Network out of China. They plan on putting 13,000 satellites in orbit, but they're only going to have 60 test satellites up by 2022. They don't have the global ground station network in place to manage all of these. So they're going to have to do a lot of uh, ground deployment in foreign countries in order to be able to control the Constellation Satellite Network. So I think they're gonna, it's gonna take longer than they think. Okay, geosynchronous versus geostationary. These words are not directly interchangeable. If something is geostationary, it's in a specific spot overhead. If something is geosynchronous, then um, its orbit is inclined along the equator. And the most popular of these satellites are Direct TV uh, and uh, their competitors. Um, they put up satellites in uh, geosynchronous orbit. So they're not only rotating with the speed of the Earth, so they're overhead a spot all the time. They're also along the equator. That way, everybody can point your antennas in the same direction and everybody get the signal. So these Satellites have to have a very powerful radio transmitter to cover what amounts to an entire hemisphere with one satellite. And so that's why you see, why are all the direct TV satellites pointing at the same place in space? Because that's where the satellite is. So but is that, is that, is geo, are they geostationary along the equator? They're geosynchronous, which is geostationary. So uh, the, the stationary just implies you're going around fast enough to be in the same spot overhead. Geosynchronous implies, and your inclination of orbit is with the equator. Yeah. So that's why the two words are related, but not identical. 
You can actually have a geostationary satellite that's over the North Pole and South Pole if you wanted to. In fact, they, they refer to those as sun synchronous orbits. And what they do is they will actually orbit the Earth pole to pole as the Earth rotates and they can do stripes. So Earth observation satellites are off, often in sun synchronous orbits. They're actually going around the Earth at the same speed roughly as the Earth rotates. But if you tilt that 90 degrees, you're going to be drawing over the surface of the Earth as the Earth rotates underneath you. And there are different orbits for different things. The low Earth orbit is the best for um, communications because the light travel time, the speed of light travel time to you know, 100 miles up plus is shorter than if you went 23,000 miles up to geostationary. Um, there are internet service providers that operate geo satellites, but the transit delay is a good portion of a second up and down. And so they can give you, you know, 100 megabit transfer speed, but the packet delay time up and down can be a full second. So if you're, if you're expecting to run, you know, a VoIP call or a video game or something like that off of a geostationary satellite, don't count on it. Being in low Earth orbit, the satellites also cross overhead quickly. So the amount of time that a ground station like your house will have with a satellite is only a matter of a few minutes. The ones that they want to put up now are even lower altitude. So they're going to go across the sky very quickly in about a minute or less. And the reason for that is they can service more customers with a single satellite. And if you put two decks of these so that they're overlapping spheres by 45 degrees, there'll always be at least one satellite crossing overhead for you. And if you, if you think about it as, if I'm in a car driving down the road and I'm going from mobile cell phone tower to mobile cell phone tower, this is just, you turn that on its head and say, I'm in my house stationary, except for the Earth rotation, and the satellites are going overhead. So it, it, cell phone switching technology just flipped upside down. Now, because they're in such low orbits, if something were to go wrong, um, you know, in five years or less, this thing is going to deorbit all by itself with no extra effort because the Earth's atmosphere is always uh, retarding it and slowing it down and eventually burning it up. But it also means if you can advance the technology, as in about every five years, you're going to need to replace that satellite because it's going to run out of fuel to keep itself in that particular orbit. And because the satellites are smaller and they have a shorter lifespan, you have to build them cheaper and make it cheap to launch and quick to get them up to orbit. So a lot of the guys that do big stuff and put up high altitude satellites are in the wrong market. They're in the wrong niche for being able to do constellation satellite systems. So you can see that, you know, Tesla, that uh, SpaceX doing Starlink is kind of a, a good marriage. That if you've got a Falcon 9, you can launch 60 of these things at a time. And when you've got the next generation uh, SpaceX launch vehicle, you might be able to launch 300 of these things at a time. But that's all because it's in one company. It's all in, in the SpaceX company. And uh, when you go out to other companies like OneWeb and Blue Origin Kuiper, they're having to outsource the launches. And that costs billions more. So it's going to be too expensive maybe for them to put up as many satellites as they say they want to. But don't the dead ones burn up automatically? Just, you know, they just fall back because they're not in control. Uh, yes, yeah, some do. Some uh, go off on a tangent because they have a malfunction. Uh, some get pushed out of position because their navigational fuel is exhausted and the solar wind acts like a solar sail. Remember the ones that's Greyhound bus size? Well, if you have a flat on that side and that's the side facing the sun, it'll actually push the satellite. So it'll change its orbit. Mm. So that will bring some down. But there's a misconception that eventually those things fall back. The Vanguard 1 satellite, the Vanguard 2 satellite, and the Vanguard 3 satellite, for 
from the late 1950s are all still up there. And the Telstar communication satellite, Telstar 1, from 1962 is also still up there. None of these are functional anymore, and they don't have any fuel or control. They're just up there in whatever orbit the solar wind happens to put them in. And right now they're stable, so they're not going to be moving about much. But uh, they're an impediment, because once they get into a particular orbit, you can't put a satellite there. I mean, there are spent rocket boosters. Vanguard 1, the satellite is still up there. Vanguard 1's spent rocket booster for Vanguard 1 and Vanguard 2, those are still up there. And the small things they do track, there's actually a clamp left over from Vanguard 1 that's still in orbit that is still being tracked because the clamp is apparently large enough and moving in a direction such that, you know, if that hit the ISS, it, it would make a hole in it and you know, have to worry about evacuating the atmosphere. I doubt that it would tear up the ISS, but uh, you know, could put a solar panel out of commission. Hmm. Well, don't we have agencies governing all this stuff to make sure that you know bad things don't happen? Yeah, we do. And they do govern stuff. But there's only so much you can do. Unless you want to put a complete moratorium on satellites orbiting the Earth. But the nations wouldn't like that because they like their spy satellites. They like their big you know, multi-billion dollar communication satellites. That's all good stuff. So they're going to make you fill out a permit. You know, if the, you know, apply for, please, please government, I would like to put up a satellite. And then they grill you through what kind of launch vehicle, when you're gonna do it, what's the orbit, what radio frequencies are you using? What's your plan for bringing it back down? How do you plan on doing debris mitigation? Is your satellite made from toxic things? Does it have radioactive materials on it? So you have to go through all this stuff. And what you find out is there's evidence out there that, yeah, uh, Starlink went through all these push-ups and um, they still were able to put over a thousand things in orbit. Uh, and that's just our country. That's just one nation. Now, once you get outside the U.S., uh, there are UN, uh, there's a UN office of outer space affairs that's supposed to do this for the entire planet. But obviously, they get a lot of assistance from uh, US Space Command, the Space Force, on tracking things, because the UN doesn't have the radar dishes to track all this stuff. So they count heavily on the US. Most nations won't go rogue on this because they know how serious this stuff is. So they are cooperative rather than destructive. Although we know that China did launch a satellite and deliberately blow it up just to see that they could do it. But smaller nations lack the technology and the US monitors launches. So if some small nation decided to you know, build itself a rocket the size of uh, one of the electron uh, rockets from Rocket Lab, um, we would detect it because not because we're looking for rogue rocket launches, but we're looking for rogue nuclear warhead launches. And governments are still launching the biggest, brightest stuff. And sad to say it, but the largest stuff that goes up there that's the most reflective are the satellites meant to do Earth environmental and weather studies. The Landsat series of satellites, the GOES series of satellites, those are big, highly reflective, and they last a long time but they ran out of fuel. So every so often you got to launch another one. And what happens to the one that was up there? You just put it into a parking orbit and it stays up there for hundreds of years as a dead satellite. But there are also big satellites up there that are for clandestine missions from the National Reconnaissance Office. The Corona program has satellite, the US National Reconnaissance Office, the CIA has spy satellites up there. There are seven up there from the Corona series, four up there from the Samo series, six up there from the Gambit series. Uh, then there's the Lanyard, which was one, the Hexagon, which was one, and the Keenan or KH-11 that uh, they don't disclose how many of them are up there, but you can go look it up. Except for a few in the Keenan series, all the other ones are essentially debris. They're all dead, long time ago. There are Earth-orbiting uh, satellites 
that need to be up there for a long time, but they have uh, radars on board. So they're doing microwave uh, surface analysis and water level analysis. And two of them are Aura, which is looking at land masses, and Aqua, which is looking at sea level rise. And in order to detect sea level rise to a fraction of an inch on a regular basis, you have to have a large microwave array to do that. And the transmit power that you're going to be using needs to come from somewhere. So you need enormous solar arrays to do this. You remember that large billboard size? And I said, and it's got two of them? That's Aqua. So in 2008, there were 100 active satellites just for Earth monitoring, for Earth environmental monitoring, 150 of them from multiple nations. So the US launches so many satellites that they can't talk with one another. And there are not enough ground stations to go around for all the channels they want to talk to. So they launch satellites just to talk to other satellites. So there is a satellite system that the US has called TDRS, T-D-R-S. And TDRS is used to communicate with deep space network stations. So if you think of, okay, we've got something on Mars and it's talking to the receiving station of the deep space network that's in Australia. Well, we haven't got fiber optic high bandwidth connections going from Australia to mainland California. So what it does is it goes from Mars to Australia, the deep space network receiving station. And then it goes back up to another satellite that's a TDRS satellite that it then goes back down to the TDRS station in uh, the west coast of the US. So it goes up, down, up. So we put up satellites just to talk with other satellites. So these are some of the biggest ones that the US has put up there. You can see Aqua and it's two billboard size arrays. You can see Aura. Aura just has gobs of equipment and a giant parabolic dish uh, to do its microwave studies. Now remember you talk about satellites to talk to other satellites? This one in the middle is the latest generation TDRS. Enormous uh, solar arrays plus two, those are probably 60 foot diameter parabolic dishes. And then a smaller dish that's probably a meter sized dish. Um, that's one of them. And there's multiple TDRS satellites up there. Then there's the GPS satellites. This is a uh, contemporary GPS three style satellite uh, that uh, now uh, uh, SpaceX launches these one per Falcon 9 because there's money in GPS, a lot of funding there. So we can dedicate an entire Falcon 9 launch just for GPS. And they have large solar arrays. And the thing in the lower right that, oh, isn't that Hubble? No, that's not Hubble. That's a US National Reconnaissance Office KH-11 spy satellite. But it looks so much like Hubble. The only way you can tell a KH-11 from Hubble is Hubble, that cylinder that's on the back end, the larger diameter cylinder, that cylinder on Hubble is longer by about one third. Everything else looks the same. And people say, well, no wonder the mirror focus was off when they first launched Hubble. It was meant to point down, but they'll swear that, no, 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 that, would, no, that has nothing to do with it. Well, the Perk and Elmer just grounded to the wrong focal length. No, they grounded to the right focal length. They just, they meant it to point downward, not out at infinity, so you needed something to correct for that. So the last shuttle mission that they went up there and did servicing on the Hubble, they replaced the uh, secondary mirror assembly on the uh, reflector and put it out a little further so that now the mirror would be at the proper focal length. The next deep space telescope after the James Webb is a modified KH-11. But they know about it going in this time, and they've already stated, and we've touched up the, the mirror curve because it's you know pointing out. When people talk about orbits, they're not talking about one radius out from the Earth. They're talking about multiple radii out from the Earth. And different orbits are for different purposes. 
where you see Galileo, GPS, uh, Baidao, Mio, GLONASS. This is the medium Earth orbiting satellites. This is where all the GPS stuff is at. Um, GLONASS is the Russian one. I think Baidu is the, uh, the Chinese one. Galileo is Great Britain and ours is GPS. And you see where it says inner Van Allen belt? That's the radiation belt. So once you realize that that's gonna destroy your electronics if you put your satellite there, you either put your satellite below it, like ISS is below the Van Allen belt, or you put it above it, like the GPS satellites and the geostationary satellites. So there are places where you can put stuff and that's good. And there are places where you will not be putting stuff and that's just, that's kind of wasted space in Earth orbit. So you have to either put it low, put it medium or put it high. There's kind of gaps in between that just, they don't make economic sense to put them there. And then the orbits themselves, think of nested shells and stations. If you were to look at a single inclination, an elevation view, you would see that satellite orbits are concentric, concentric circles. This, this is not assuming that it's an elongated orbit. These are circular orbits. Okay, that's in one dimension. If you said, now I'm going to tilt that, I get another set of orbits every angle that I tilt it at. So you get inclination. So you've got the rings and then you've got the inclination and you can put multiple satellites in the same orbital slot. So I, on a single ring at a certain inclination, I can have a number of stations or slots where I can put a satellite. So the number of places that I can put satellites is fairly large because space be big, as the saying goes. Um, in one uh, range of orbital elevations from uh, 133 miles to 500 miles, that's just 30 shells. And if you put all those at different inclinations, you can have 9,200 plus satellites just in that one orbital plane. Space be big. So if you add that across all of the LEO shells, and then you go out to medium and geo, and then you add in the Molnia orbits after that, there's plenty enough space for all of these constellation satellite programs. It's just a matter of organizations like the FAA and the FCC saying, this is your station, you stay there. Now, how do we keep track of all this stuff? Space Command, US Space Command keeps track of all this stuff. They have their radars and they track all the stuff 24 seven. And they produce publicly accessible, uh, accessible data sets that allow the public to know exactly where a satellite's going to be. And there are pieces of software that allow you to load up these orbital elements and then you can go in your planetarium software and say, I wonder where the IS is now. And when is it gonna be going overhead? And that's how they predict these things. And an example of just one satellite, the ISS and its current orbit, it's these three lines down at the bottom of this page. Now, how do they name them? ISS is the common name for the Zarya module. The Zarya module, is the first module of the International Space Station and it was put up there by Russia. So the way in which the ISS is tracked is by tracking the Zarya module. So if you wanna think of the ISS as being international and Russia having a piece of it, yeah, they were the first building block that went up there. So that's how we know where the ISS is, is by where the Zarya module is. Now, there's lots of other modules on the ISS, and strangely enough, it tracks all of those separately, even though they're on the same physical structure. So what about independent oversight? Well, the American Astronomical Society, in conjunction with the U.S. National Science Foundation, uh, does these things called uh, satellite constellation conferences, and they had one a year ago called SATCON 1, and they had one this year called SATCON 2. 
And although there's like 500 people that attend these things online, um, they're kind of running out of bad boy topics to talk about. Um, you know, they, they've got these constellation satellites, they're ruining it for us astronomers. Uh, okay. Well, the first SATCON, they didn't have a lot of other vendors there, but they did have Starlink there. So of course that was their focus of abuse. And so everything went wrong with them. Uh, what about the other companies like OneWeb or uh, companies that put up uh, communication satellites like governments? Oh, those are the gorillas in the room, the elephants in the room. We don't talk about those. So this, the first SATCON report had a lot of non-real world simulations. They couldn't get the actual specifications on a lot of satellites. So they just ballparked them and said, of course it will be reflected. And instead of the satellite being the actual shape of the satellite, they made them spherical objects, highly reflective, because that way they look bad. Um, not all the Constellation satellite companies agreed to conform. Uh, Starlink is definitely saying we conform with the FAA and the FCC rules. And Starlink has also been participating at these sessions and going, guys, we already painted the, the matte finish on the antennas black. The whole thing is the size of a ping pong table. We put the solar panel above it and uh, the surface of the satellite is this pebble finish to scatter light. What more do you want us to do? Well, at SATCON 1, they wanted to propose a complete moratorium on constellation satellites. And the big government and big corporations came in and said, Shh, no, you can't do that because that would hurt us too. And no. So, so SATCON 2 is trying to drum up public awareness and put up a, a public information hub to say all the bad stuff that's involved with this. But uh, they're, they're now saying uh, the report from SATCON 2 will be out two months after the event occurred. That will be next month. So far, there's been no draft report, which they're calling the final report. So I don't think there's going to be a SATCOM 3. So they, they've milked this as far as they can milk it, it looks like. And uh, enough people are paying attention that it's a serious thing. So once you've done your due diligence and you're following all the rules, what more do you want to do? In the SATCON 2 presentation, which you can download, it's publicly available. I did find it interesting that in the community engagement section in the presentation, they actually had these bullet points. The sky belongs to everyone. Space is a global commons. All people are impacted by changes in the sky. The sky is part of the environment and ecosystems depend on the night sky and on each other. They're all wonderful platitudes. But if you apply that equally, including the astronomical science community and amateur astronomy, then you have to say the sky belongs to everyone, not just the astronomical community. Space is a global commons that all should share in, not just governments and big corporations. All people are impacted by changes in the sky. Okay, good, let's deorbit that dead junk that the governments put up there from the late 1950s. And I know it's not cost effective, but if you really want to you know, focus on improving things, deorbit the dead junk. And the sky is part of the environment. Yes, governments and large telecommunication corporations should stop polluting the sky with bust sized dead junk. And ecosystems depend on the night sky and on each other. So the ISS is no longer fun to watch. It's large, it's bright, and it comes overhead every 90 minutes. So, you know, if you want to have these platitudes, uh, let's not ignore the elephants and gorillas in the room. Here's the scary button, not real stuff. You might have seen these in uh, media hype or online sites where they show you all the satellites that are up there. You've got to think about the graphics and the computer animation for just a moment. If the Earth's diameter is almost 8,000 miles, and most satellites orbit in the uh, you know, 120 to 12,000 mile range, so LEO to MEO. Uh, 
how big would these satellites actually be in a graphic where the Earth is three inches across? The satellites would be so small, they would not even appear as a single pixel. So when you see these bad boy pictures of, look at all the satellites in orbit around the Earth, it's horrible. They're going to run into each other. None of it's realistic. Because if you really evaluated it as, okay, how about a, um, you know, let's do a one meter size globe of the Earth. How big would the satellites be? Ten point? Well, if you put up a thousand ten points in something that large and you spread it over a thickness of, you know, uh, probably two feet, there's still going to be a lot of gaps and a lot of open space. So scary, but not real. And if you want to find the brightest stuff up, stuff up there, there's a website called Celeste Track that tracks all the stuff. They get the, uh, the, two, the three line elements and then they make them available to people. Uh, but if you said, show me the 100 brightest things that are up there, you wouldn't see a single SpaceX Starlink satellite in the list because compared to all the other things that are up there, they're nowhere near as bright. What you do find is lots of space junk dating back to 63 that is bigger and brighter than Starlink. And most of these bright objects orbit about every 90 to 100 minutes, meaning in a uh, dawn or, or sunset period, you might actually see them go by twice And this is no telescope required, no long exposure required. These are bright enough to see, but nobody wants to make the effort to go remove those. Nobody complains when they launch another one of those. So just be aware of, there's some fear mongering out there, potentially by, you know, let's just say Starlink competitors. And uh, this has actually happened to a couple of amateur astronomers where they see all these bad Starlink satellites, and um, they're going to go look at them with their camera. So they point their telescope up in the sky where the satellite should be, and they only want to get one satellite, not a constellation of them. So they, they point where the satellite should be, and they don't record the satellite. And then they increase their exposure, and they don't record the satellite. And then they increase the exposure where all the stars are bloomed, and they get one more star in the image. That's how dim the satellites are once they are at station. And the reason for that is, look on the right here. When a Starlink satellite is first put into orbit, it's lower than it actually will wind up being. So it uses its ion propulsion to push itself up to its actual orbit, its 500 kilometer um, orbit. And when they do that, in order to keep the atmospheric drag down, they orient the solar panel out flat. So the panel uh, is pointing flat, the satellite is pointing flat, and when the sun reflects off of it, it's very bright because the panel is pointing down. Once they get to their orbital station, they reorient themselves and the panel opens upward. Think about the sun shining off of this. If you said, I know where the satellite's going to be overhead right now. If there's a sun reflection off the solar panel, where is the reflection going to wind up? The reflection is going to wind up going over the edge of the limb of the earth. Because this thing is you know, 500 kilometers up and the panel is pointing vertical and if the sun shines off of it, angle of incidence, angle of reflection, and the sun will actually, the reflection will actually go over the edge of the earth, which explains why you don't see them. So that's why Starlink satellites, when they're first up there, they're so bright and you can see a squadron of them, you know, going fast overhead. And then when they get to their actual orbital position, they kind of disappear. And this is how they kind of disappear. And it's done on purpose because they know that if they had thousands of these things up in orbit, 
and they were all little glowy spots in the sky, they'd be run out of town on a rail, so to speak. So they went to the effort to think about these things. You've got to ask yourself, is OneWeb and uh, Amazon Kuiper, are, are, are they doing the same sort of thing? Take a look at their satellites and you know, see if they paid attention to the same level of detail. Don't think so. Here's some other players. You don't hear about these in the media. Uh, Utelsat. Utelsat has 25 satellites already up there and they're big, heavy satellites that they launch into geostationary positions. They use an Ariane 5 to launch one at a time. Uh, they wanna launch a constellation of these 25 more by 2022. Uh, if it has to be launched by an Ariane 5, it's going to be big. It's going to go into geo. It's going to be a communication satellite. So it's going to have large parabolic antennas on it. And it's going to have large solar panels for all the transmit power it needs. But you don't hear about that in the media. Here's a long-term player, Intelsat. These guys have been around a long time and under a couple of different names. Uh, they're going to launch what is known as OneSat. They currently operate 16 satellites, and they're in a variety of orbits. The satellites are actually designed by Airbus over in Europe. They want to create a common satellite design reference that companies will buy into and put up additional satellites where it will cost less money to make the satellites and launch the satellites. So it's good to see the reusability, but the problem is these are not small satellites. And uh, if, if you own a large ocean going vessel or you're um, an airline, you may have heard of Inmarsat. They're the folks that have the geostationary satellites used for um, commercial jetliner Wi Fi. So when you get your internet access on board your transatlantic flight, you're getting it via satellite because there's nothing on the ground beneath you to communicate with. So you'll see that this program. Um, is used for ships at sea, railroads, uh, agricultural, large combine, you know, remote farms, uh, the US military, and uh, uh, remote um, internet of things sensors. Now you see military in here, but you also see this is geostationary. And you remember the delay associated with geostationary satellites. This is why the US military is interested in doing business with Starlink, because the delay, the transit delay, and the speed will be much better with that than you can achieve with geostationary orbiting satellites. One of the things that Inmarsat wants to do to create more revenue for itself is um, they've looked at the 5G mobile communications infrastructure that's being deployed. And if, if you actually see this, you'll see that regular cell phone towers will get a certain band new long distance towers will get a different band. And then within metropolitan areas, you'll see what looks like uh, short street light poles with flat panels on them. And those are the high band uh, gigabit class cell phone towers. But they have to wire up every one of those to um, you know, a network connection to get the bandwidth. So what they've done is say, what if we want to deploy these high bandwidth and we just pop a cell phone, you know, pop a satellite antenna on top, would backhauling this through a low earth orbiting satellite network work? So that's what Inmarsat is trying to do with their orchestra, is to have uh, 100 to 175 new low earth orbiting satellites that would create a uh, mesh network for 5G um, street corner satellite, uh, street corner cell towers. So we'll see whether it sells or not. Now, uh, I do take the astronomical research concerns seriously, and I did an analysis on this. And I've got to say, yes, they uh, cook the books, so to speak. This is from the uh, uh, Rubin satellite, so the Rubin satellite, the Rubin Observatory. And uh, it's a long duration exposure. You can tell it's really long duration because that star is overexposed. 
it shouldn't be that bright. But that's a, a you know, bright star and it's overexposed. Here's another one down here that's overexposed. But if they didn't overexpose them, then the Starlink lines wouldn't look so offensive. But if you look closely, all these black lines, it's because in order to make this gigapixel size imager, they actually use megapixel sized individual imaging chips, and then they pack them as close together inside of a, a frame as they can get them, but there are still dead areas where you're between this imaging chip and this imaging chip, and therefore you have a black line between them, a black line above them, and a black line below them that you cannot receive any stars in. So what are they doing about that? Because if you count up the amount of black space in this picture, you'll find that it's far more than the amount of white streaks in this picture. The second thing is these imaging chips are not perfect. They have dropouts. So this particular imaging chip, half of it is not functioning. And if you zoom up, you can actually see that it's black. You can't receive anything there. So what about the stars that fall into that area? And then, well, when you overexpose it, you're going to have this bloom effect. And you see the stars that are right in the edge of this um, overblown star. You can't tell what's going on with those stars. You just have to draw a giant circle around the star and just punch that out and say, no data for you in this area. But this, this was the, the best hypocrisy of it. Uh, you might ask yourself, well, there's other satellites up there. How is it that only the Starlink satellites are a problem? Oh, no, no. All those other satellites in space junk that are up there are reflecting too but they have software that removes them. And if you want proof of it, this particular imaging chip right here, if you look right there, I zoomed it up and you see this little gray line right here, that's where they averaged out a satellite. So they already have software that could take out all these lines. And if they would reduce the exposure down to the level that they want, wouldn't be a problem. This is why they're losing the public community on this, because people are starting to get wise to it. But you don't want them up there at all. You don't want to kind of have to work hard for a living. You just, you know, you want what you want. I understand that. But as the saying goes, you have to share. So shouldn't we be concerned? Yes, that's a simplistic answer. Always be concerned and demand oversight anytime you have a finite resource that has to be shared. Some orbits are better than others for different types of things. Um, some orbits are not viable. So for example, I wanna have a geosynchronous satellite for a service that I'm offering. Well, if you position it in a slot that's over water or over Siberia, you're not gonna get many customers. And then there's the unusable altitudes like the Van Allen belts. Um, field of view is a concern. Dynamic orbits are not practical. So the, the concept of your typical Greyhound bus size satellite saying, oh, I see something coming. I'll just use my thrusters and move myself out of the way and then move myself back. That's not practical. But it is for the SpaceX Starlink satellites because they're so much smaller and they have ion thrusters on board. So do have everyone follow the rules, do get the necessary government sign offs. And once you're done with that, that's it. Anything else is, uh, you know, unwarranted moratorium paranoia. So the ones that follow the rules should be considered as they're following the rules. If you want the rules to be different, fine, change the rule. But if they're following the rules and you don't like the outcome, that's not their problem. What about getting rid of the junk? Okay, the European Space Agency actually has a, an office for space debris removal. Uh, they're looking at sending up a booster to um, put certain expensive satellites, you know, billion dollar commercial uh, communication satellites, 
put them back up in the orbit where they belong. It's too expensive for these satellites that are dead because you're not going to make any money off of them. But for the otherwise operating very expensive satellites, sure, send up a booster, have it attached to the satellite, push it back up to where it belongs, and now it's good for you know another 10 years. But eventually, what do you do? Well, send up another booster 10 years from now? Eventually, you just, you know, you're prolonging the inevitable. Maybe you send up a smaller booster to just deorbit the satellite. Um, so it's meant for the satellites that are partially fueled so they can actually burn themselves up, uh, which is part of the plan for the SpaceX Starlink satellites. They have a fuel reserve that says, uh, we don't want to fly you until your fuel is exhausted. So take the remaining fuel and point yourself down and burn yourself up over the Pacific Ocean or the Atlantic Ocean. This was something that I thought was just kind of a harebrained scheme on my part. Um, but uh, it turns out they're actually thinking about doing it, just not in the direction I'm thinking. So if you were to put um, high photon output satellites uh, into an orbit above geosynchronous, so that they're orbiting the Earth, but they're higher than all other satellites, you could use lasers or very bright LED packages to shine on satellites that are below that you want to slowly push down. Now, you wouldn't be vaporizing the satellite, uh, and you would be avoiding satellites like you know, ISS, crewed spacecraft, and the Hubble. But you could use a beam of light that's maybe only a few kilowatts to just repeatedly nudge it slower. You know, if, it, if the satellite's here and you shoot the beam that way, you can put it into the leading edge of the satellite and be slowing it down. And as you slow it down, it's going to change its orbit. Or you can be pushing it from above and it will just slowly push it down. You have to make sure you push it down into an open orbit. Don't put it where something else is already there. And um, these ought to be fairly cheap. They might have a large solar panel on them, but uh, you can use the same, you know, uh, sunlight as a solar sail kind of philosophy that you're using to deorbit the satellite, you could use that, um, you know, to keep itself up there. So I've jokingly referred to these as photon tugs. And it turns out that there is uh, research programs to put up gigawatt lasers on the Earth to point up at satellites to vaporize, you know, like, you're not going to vaporize something the size of a Greyhound bus. That, that's just too much power. But what you can do is say, okay, if I shoot up a gigawatt beam, I can probably take out the individual parts or the paint chips or the metal flakes. And that's about all I can do. So I see this as more of a program of cleaning up the, the dust bunnies to make room for more commercial satellites. So if you see money being spent here, say, well, what about those big satellites? Are you going to get rid of those too by vaporizing them? Uh, no, that would take too much energy. Okay, in conclusion, there are thousands, thousands of satellites already up there, about half of which are no longer operational. Uh, there are over 100 that are just spent rocket boosters. There's thousands of pieces of just debris, not actually even satellites or, or boosters. Um, besides SpaceX, organizations and governments are launching big, bright satellites. The biggest and brightest thing are not being launched by SpaceX. They're not Starlink. They're being launched by governments and large corporations. So the next time you see any negative hype about SpaceX Starlink Constellation satellites, ask these questions. Are the individual satellites so massive they require an Ariane 5 or an Atlas 5 to launch just one satellite? Those are big satellites. Can they launch 60 satellites using a single launch vehicle like a Falcon 9? If not, maybe their satellites are too big. So after they get on their orbital station, can you still see them reflecting? If you can, then maybe their solar panels or their body aren't doing enough to keep them dark. So what about all the larger, brighter, slower moving and geostationary stuff that's already up there? What about them? Launching more of those? Yes, we are. That's all that new stuff put up there by the U.S. government, U.S. corporations, 
other than SpaceX. So what about all the stuff being put up there by non-US corporations and nations other than the US? How do you deal with those? Well, you hope the UN has a say in it. You hope the uh, European Space Agency has a say in it. So once again, when somebody says, how do you know all this stuff? Uh, I provide links where you can learn it too. Um, you can even look up the current orbital position of CIA military uh, craft like the X-37B, that little mini shuttle that they put up periodically. Um, or you can go get some free software and have it chart all the satellites for you. Or you can go on heavens dash above and put in your location and say, what are the next uh, five days worth of bright things going overhead? So you too can learn. And that's all I had. I've got a, a kind of a question. Sure. Uh, the, um, during World War II, they had a Operation Mincemeat or the Man Who Never Was movie where they had a, a dummy body with fake plans about invasion of Sicily or something. Mm -hmm. uh, and then Ronald Reagan kind of put it out there that we had laser satellites that mm -hmm. would shoot down nuclear missiles. And that really put a damper on um, a Russian uh, um, uh, ambitions. And they, they attribute that partially to the fall of the Berlin Wall. Is it, is it possible to put up fancy looking, totally dummy um, uh, satellites that look like, well, they got all kinds of stuff. They may not have anything on them, but uh, put those up as sort of like uh, we can shut your government down from space, you know, type of a thing. You remember uh, the line from the movie Dune, Fear is the Mind Killer? Yes. Well, there you go. So I mean, during World War II in North Africa, they put out inflated jeeps and tanks and artillery. I remember to, that. To, to make the Germans believe that they had a lot greater arsenal than they actually did. Right. So I, I, don't, I wouldn't put it past governments to put up satellites that were barely functional, just uh -huh. to have them look threatening. And in fact, they may even periodically put out radio transmissions that the other, other governments can receive and the transmissions are encrypted just to make them waste time trying to decrypt them. Yeah. But if you, think of, if you think about the price of a launch vehicle of a large satellite, that's too many hundreds of millions of dollars. And then you have to build the satellite, even if it's a dummy, which could be millions of dollars more. I, I think they're just gonna put up the real deal. Now they may put up things that you don't wanna know what they actually put up there. There was the concept of um, nuclear missile launch platforms back in yeah. the 70s, putting those up into space. So you could drop a nuke on someone in under an hour. Right. And they would put them in orbits where uh, they would be geostationary over a country you didn't like. Right. Uh, do I think those are up there? I have no idea. Uh -huh. but, but think of it this way. If you wanted to drop one of those on a country, it wouldn't need a big rocket. The rocket would only be used for steering the momentum it would gather is courtesy of the Earth's gravity. So if you've ever seen some of those sci-fi movies where we put up the nuclear platforms in space and they have giant full-size missiles launching from them, no, that, that, that would not be what would actually take place. They would be very small. It, they would look like just the top of a rocket and the propulsion system on the back end of them could be solid fuel. So it would just last forever as long as the satellite's up there. And how many would you need? Well, if you put a half a dozen of those on a single satellite over a country you don't like, that would be more than enough. Yeah. Well, I was but, thinking in terms of uh, like a cyber uh, disruption, uh, it'll at least appear to be 
uh, something like that. So well, there, there's Real Genius, the movie Real Genius with Val Kilmer. Uh, let's um, put a gigawatt laser in space and we can vaporize a target from orbit. Well, that's what if you want to make a house full of popcorn. <laughs> yes, yes. But if, if you want to vaporize, let's say, a Russian nuclear missile on its launcher, you, you could essentially detonate it from space. And if you've ever seen that there is, there is an air, a US Air Force aircraft that does have a laser on board. It takes up the entire length of a 747 for one laser. Yeah, have so enough amazing. power to have enough power to take out a warhead that's maybe a thousand miles away, and it's at the same orbital altitude, so even closer than that. So attempting to put up a gigawatt laser in space to vaporize something large on the ground, where are you going to get the power? Oh well, well nuclear power the satellite. Oh that'll be good. That'll well, never. Well, Frank, well Reagan, it wasn't. It wasn't even real, but yeah. it was enough to make them believe it was real. Yeah, and fear is the mind killer. If I can create the perception yes. of something that I don't have, and that makes you fearful, that will change your behavior. And if that's all I really wanted, mission accomplished. Yeah, well, that's kind of the, the theory behind politics right now. You get people to fear something mm -hmm. more than have hope, yeah. you know, you you can get them to vote one way or the other. But, well, in, uh, in, in this particular case, I think the media hype to fear SpaceX Starlink as um, a boondoggle that's going to destroy astronomical research the planet wide. Um, I think that that's not at the government level. I think that that's at the competition level. And they've yeah. got, they've got, uh, the professional astronomy community in the U.S. in particular aligned with them uh -huh. because, strangely enough, astronomers don't know everything. I don't know everything, but yes, I've do. taken the I've yeah I've taken the time to learn more than the average person, and I go outside my boundaries, so to speak. If I stayed in my boundaries, I would just be writing software. I'm a software engineer by right. you know college education. But I learned these other things, and I learned things like when you show me a picture of the Earth, and it's you know two or three inches across, and then you show me all these satellites in orbit around the Earth, and they're going to run into each other. I just yes. go scale. Anybody up for scale of this? <laughs> if you scaled it correctly, you wouldn't even see the satellite. Right. Oh, but that wouldn't that wouldn't frighten anyone. That wouldn't, you know, that wouldn't get you SATCON 3. All right. So, you know, that's why I do these kinds of things is to try and get a little more information out there. When I put it out for the public, maybe somebody will watch it. Maybe somebody will, um, you know, send comments in to want to burn me an effigy, and that's fine. <laughs> but other people might go, uh, yeah, I never thought of it that way. I don't think it's yeah. going to be a bit as big a problem as everybody's letting on to believe. And who would who would be putting out such misinformation? Well, I don't know. SpaceX SpaceX is successful. Would Blue Origin or OneWeb be not above spending money with these other organizations to make sure that they have lots of negative media coverage? Yeah. So very likely. Then there's reality. <laughs> uh, yeah, but but, remember, but, remember, they are coming next Thursday, and that's what we're going to talk about next week is um, basically moving our mindset to if you are an extraterrestrial and you wanted to come pay a visit to the Earth, what would your point of view be versus that of the silly humans on the planet? So maybe oh. that one will get a large audience next week. Because we're talking yeah. about ET, there is a uh, wealthy executive producer called J.J. Abrams. He's the guy that rebooted the Star uh, the Star Trek movie series. Star Trek, yeah. yeah. You know, he has a company called Bad Robot. Yep, I love Bad Robot. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. And 
One of the things that Bad Robot recently funded, produced, was the latest information on extraterrestrials are here already. And Showtime paid him millions of dollars to put that on the Showtime network. And it's nothing more than, I, I watched you know, the premiere episode of that now. It's nothing more than a rehash of the information already there. They're not connecting any yeah. dots. They're not saying things like radio. Who still uses radio? Um, you know, the stuff that yeah. we talked about. <laughs> right. Can you explain a little bit more uh, what you said about Hubble and the spy satellite? Oh, mirror? yeah. So I love that one. Really intended to point down. Uh, I love that one. Let me That's go back really here. interesting. I had not heard that before. So did they just follow an existing blueprint for a spy no, satellite? No, it was, no, it was, it was better. It was, it was much better than that. And this is what's happening um, with, the sat with the space telescope after the James Webb. When the CIA contracts private companies like Northrop Grumman or whoever to build these spy satellites, they contract them to build, you know, 10, 12 of these because they'll put them up every so often and then they'll deorbit them, burn them up, or just let them sit up there waiting for the next mission. And uh, every time they do that, they want to put newer and better technology on board. So they cookie cutter them. So the corporations that build these things, they build the uh, mirrors to a certain spec size and they have a focal length, which is pointing down at the earth. Yeah. And then, okay, what do you want in the next one? And what do you want in the next one? Well, the KH-11 program is, is going the way of the dodo and the CIA is finding another way to do these satellites. They're launching them on Falcon 9 as much smaller, much shorter duration satellites with far more advanced technology so this, the U.S. National Reconnaissance Office, the CIA, had uh, some spares left over. They had mirrors. They had satellites. And uh, so, NASA, you want to build a space telescope. Well, you're going to need a mirror. You're going to need a satellite. And you're going to need a space shuttle to put it up there. And uh, do we have a couple of freebies for you? It turns out these mirrors are so high precision that you have to store them in an environmentally controlled chamber. And in order to do that, when you're not using them, it costs about a million dollars a year just to store these suckers. They're, oh, wow. one meter, they're one meter sized mirrors. And when it came time to build the Hubble Space Telescope, they literally took a KH-11, redesigned the back end of it, used the same mirror and built the Hubble. And it fit inside the shuttle cargo bay, which was being used to launch KH-11 spy satellite. So it all worked Jim Dandy until they said, and we're going to point it out at deep space and take pictures of galaxies. How come they're out of focus? Well, that's because your camera was pointing down at the earth and not out to infinity. Oh, yeah. but they want to blame Perkin Elmer for grinding the mirror wrong. Oh. Uh. Okay, I, you know, that, that's the story. You know. So they took, they actually took a mirror off the shelf that was sitting there in million dollar a year storage. Yep. Instead of making a custom one to point out into space. Wow. Yep. And even better, the KH-11 aircraft, the spacecraft body was the same. All they did was the large round tube on the butt end. They extended that down further and put large doors on it so they could replace the electronics and the electronics were actually bigger. Huh. But nice. if, if, if you ever wanna do this, just go on the internet and Google KH-11 yeah. space HST. Yep. And wow. you will see pictures of them side by side and go, damn, yeah. those look real similar. <laughs> <laughs> and as a matter of fact, NASA's owning up to it this time out. So the infrared satellite that they're putting up after James Webb is a one meter infrared satellite 
and they that, that NASA bought two mirrors from the U.S. National Reconnaissance Office, <laughs> and they had Perkin Elmer grind them differently, knowingly, because they just said because the mirrors were designed to point down, and we're having them ground differently. Good for you. You learned this time. <laughs> <laughs> But the satellite is based upon another KH-11 body. I don't mind that because if we've already spent the millions in yeah, black not? projects with the CIA and they'll make a Jim Dandy space telescope, do it. Makes sense. So Okay, so why does it cost a million dollars a year to store those mirrors? What are they doing that's costing a million dollars? I think it's because they have to be cooled down to a certain temperature and they have to be in a particulate free chamber. So it's probably an evacuated chamber and they have to maintain that all year long, which probably requires a staff of one or two to just monitor it all year. Yeah. That's worth a million bucks, sure. That's a million bucks. Yeah. <laughs> it's high tech, it's for spy satellite stuff, so it's a million bucks. Oh uh, yeah, I guess. But if, if you dig down into you know, how can we get mirrors for cheap and the relationship of KH-11, you'll see that the National Reconnaissance Office, Office claims it costs them a million dollars a year to keep these babies in storage. Mm. So you save a lot of spy money by giving them to NASA for free. But then NASA has to regrind them, put different electronics for their instruments on board, um, but the end result is the space telescope would be cheaper than if they had to build it from scratch. That makes sure. sense. So I, I just don't know. Oh, that's know right. Why. Six hundred dollar hammer, you know. Yeah. yeah. I, I just don't know why. <laughs> I just don't know why people can't connect those two dots and go, "Here's a picture of a KH-11. Here's a picture of the Hubble Space Telescope. Look similar." They, they, no, no. They, Hubble was, was not a spy satellite. No, because it was not looking down. And if you read the contract that NASA has for these two latest mirrors and the repurposing of the KH-11, the contract clearly indicates that, and it shall not be used for looking at the Earth. They don't want spy competition. This thing's going to be out at the L2 point. So it, if you grind it to infinity, and you pointed it back to the Earth, the Earth would be too close. <laughs> It'd be out of focus. Yeah. All a bit them optics. Yeah. So, any other questions or comments? No. Nope. No. Nope. Well, I'm good. <laughs> <laughs>